Boris Johnson announced the final, supposedly, stage of England's unlocking this week. The mandate to wear face masks will be lifted, as will social distancing, restrictions on crowds for sporting events and nightclubs. Meanwhile, Politico has calculated that by unlocking day on the July the 19th, there could be as many as half a million new cases pretty darn quick. Ian, on Wednesday morning, The Guardian had apocalyptic figures indicating that another 2 million people could contract the virus over the summer and 10 million could be isolating. Even Sajid Javid is admitting that we're entering what he refers to as uncharted territory. So tell us, what is the government playing at? I mean, you know, I think we can't resist like the most basic explanation, which is that, you know, they're moral delinquents with no capacity for sustained intellectual thought. And this is the kind of policy product that you get from those sets of people. There's clearly no you know, it is a complex situation and it's really hard to work out what the fuck you should do in it. However, they have not taken a complex approach to it. There's no discerning any difference between the areas that we know are safer and the areas that we know are more dangerous, right? I mean, so you look, the mask thing is the most, is the classic example of this. Well, like you can't possibly come up with an argument for why you would get rid of masks on public transport on cramped inside locations. Whereas, of course, you would on anything that is happening outside. We can kind of get rid of most restrictions on things that are happening outside. You could do that. That would make sense. You know, you don't see anything at all to prepare for the winter. Boris Johnson did a press conference the other day talking about where it's going to get worse in the winter. So, yeah, what the fuck are you doing to actually try and address that? Why don't we see any work? Why why do we not even discuss ventilation in buildings? There are various ways that you can increase ventilation in buildings, and some of them are very expensive. Some of them are much cheaper. It is just about basically putting fans by windows to keep on trying to pump the air in and out. What about trying to make sure that you actually have heating as far as possible and local council rules as far as possible that allow businesses to operate outside when we start getting to the winter? And I mean, it feels like we're in the winter at the moment because the weather is so awful, but obviously it's going to get even worse. Fair enough. Yeah, what well, we might need it now as well. Wouldn't mind heat right now. Not, none of the work, you don't see any sort of deep or um, sort of um, well calibrated work on what we know to be dangerous and what we know to be safe, what we can do to really help businesses. What you see is this sort of degenerate, hysterical drive based on half formed ideas of what liberty is, pushing us in a given direction. And that's what we're looking at. That is no more complex than that. They are a bunch of babbling babies, and we're forced to live with the repercussion of the decisions that they take. One spin that they put out was that it was it was ditch masks to save the economy. And we know that in places like East Asia, where masks have been common for a very long time because of SARS and you know cultural reasons, that it's just much more polite to cover your face if you're sneezing or coughing. China is is looking set to have, you know, 8% growth over the next year. So how are they getting away? Why why isn't there more scrutiny over these ridiculous statements about unmasking to protect the economy when other economies are outperforming us and are very well masked? You see, the thing is, I, I kind of feel that the scrutiny is there. I mean, it's there if you want to read it. You know, I mean, it's not like, you know, we talk about it, we have articles on it, it's on broadcast TV. The thing is, It's not in the things that they read. It's not really in the Telegraph. It's not really in the Mail. It's not really in the Sun. We have not, or the Express. We we haven't really, I think, sufficiently discussed how just what an abysmal state those newspapers have gotten into over the over this period. And that is not, I mean, they're they're all Brexity papers, but that does not cut down that way in the public at large. And the public at large, if anything, it cuts the other way because young people are often sort of more skeptical around this stuff. Um, It's not a Brexit Remain divide in the population, but it is in the press. And the shit you read, like when you have to do, I mean, I obviously don't read the Daily Mail on a, on, a, on a regular basis, much as I wish to escape my echo chamber. I actually fucking don't. And I really like hearing from people who know what the fuck they're talking about. But when you do read the mail, the stuff you see in it, it is just conspiracy theory nonsense. I mean, it, it has degenerated into a form of conspiracy theory. That's what they're reading. That's what they're taking from it. I also think, by the way, in addition to the economics point, I'm not sure that Boris Johnson thought he could get a vote through on masks in the Commons. Right. I think it's so much of the Tory party at this stage is just losing it, on, on specifically on the issue of masks, that I'm not sure he could get the vote through and he didn't want to rely on Labour. And I think that may well have also played a role. 
Yeah, I mean, you even had the care minister, Helen Watley, saying on Monday that she couldn't wait to stop wearing a mask. And then, of course, a few hours later, I had to say it would still be appropriate on a <laughs> crowded train or something like that. Gavin, what do you make of, of Sajid Javid's disposition in the role of health secretary? Uh, you know, Hancock's affair turns out to have been the best thing for Johnson, it seems, if he continues with the hawkish plans for unlocking that, that Hancock maybe had more of a break on. Well, yeah. uh, Look, I mean, the big picture seems to me to be we've got a government that constantly talked about dates, not data. And then when faced with anything, it sticks to the dates. And this is exactly what they did with Brexit, which was I cannot think of any major business in this country that would decide on the biggest thing that they've ever done, deciding a date for it instead of deciding what the heck it was, which is what happened with Brexit. So we're doing exactly the same thing. There's going to be July 19th and we're going to do something and it's going to be, you know, it will be the terror of the world. I know not what it is. <laughs> it's got a King King Lear on acid. Um, uh, and as for Sa- Sajid Javid, you know, he has, I think he probably would make a very fine Chancellor of the Exchequer. I mean, his politics, wh- whether you like it or not, he's probably pretty competent. But uh, if you've got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So he's suddenly in the health department and everything looks like a financial risk to the economy. So what does he do? He says, we're going to stick with this and, and we're going to move forward. And we have we have a selection of arts and other graduates telling us how important science is without understanding it. I, I was lucky enough to talk to um, Sir David Spiegelhalter, with, who's one of the leading statisticians in the country. And he was telling a story about showing politicians a graph of death rates. You know, if you're in your 20s, you're not likely to die of anything particularly soon. If you're in your 80s, you're going to die of something. So the graph goes up. He put on top of it the graph of COVID. And it's exactly the same, because if you're young, you're probably not going to die from it. And if you're old, you're not. He had politicians saying, so it's just the same death rate. And he had to explain, no, it's both of them, both. So I'm not suggesting Saji Javid was one of them, but what I am saying is that we don't have, uh, we have so many experts in this country who know what they're doing, who understand the figures, and they don't end up in parliament and they don't end up in government. And why? Because it's really about party management and loyalty. The whole thing is about party management and loyalty. So Boris Johnson doesn't do things because he knows he can't take the Conservative Party with him. He decided to publish his piece about Brexit because he can take the party with him. So it's party before country. And unfortunately, the party, the Conservative Party, is not the party that it used to be. Let's put it politely. 